Welcome to the latest episode of our podcast series for advisors considering the independent space. Today's episode is Life After Goldman Sachs, A Story of Extraordinary Success, a conversation with Justin Berman, the founder and CEO of $3 billion Berman Capital Advisor. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. This podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com and on advisorhub.com, as well as Apple Podcasts and other major podcast platforms. If you are not already a subscriber and want to be notified of new show releases, please subscribe right on your favorite podcast platform or on the episode page on our website. And if you find the content in this series to be useful and know others who could benefit from it, please feel free to share it widely. Any advisor who chooses to leave the comfort, familiarity, and support of a major firm for independence is nothing less than courageous, but it is especially brave when a Goldman Sachs advisor does so, because Goldman advisors face the most onerous of post-employment restrictions, the garden leave. And spending 60 to 90 days on the beach is a significant risk that many advisors are reluctant to take. That is, unless they had complete confidence in their client relationships and their own ability to thrive as an independent business owner. Even today, it's big news when a billion dollar plus team breaks away, but it's even bigger news when they're leaving the prestigious imprimatur of Goldman Sachs to do so. Yet advisors tell us that things are changing at the firm. So much so that in the last three years, we've seen more private wealth advisors, 14 to be exact, managing a billion dollars, or in many cases, much more than that, leave the vaunted firm than in the previous two decades combined. So imagine a Goldman advisor making the leap to independence 10 years ago. That is to leave the renowned firm and opt for independence at a time when the model wasn't nearly as mainstream as it is today. Case in point, A decade ago, Justin Berman was running a successful private wealth practice at Goldman Sachs, managing over a billion dollars in assets. But he felt things were changing at the firm, limiting his ability to serve his high net worth clients' needs and continue to grow his business. So after almost seven years with Goldman, Justin opted to make the biggest leap of all and go independent, forming Atlanta-based Berman Capital Advisors. Now, with a decade of business ownership under his belt, Justin joins the show today to share the pushes and pulls that drove his decision to make such a significant leap, what starting an independent firm was like when far fewer resources were available than they are today, how he built the firm to nearly $3 billion in assets under management, and much more. I'm especially grateful that Justin is able to be here with us today at a time when the country is busy working toward getting life and business up and running after the lockdown. And I'm eager to hear how his business has fared through the crisis. So let's jump right in. Justin, I can't thank you enough for making the time to talk with me today. Uh, You're welcome, Mindy. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So I've been excited for this conversation. I'm excited for every conversation I have, but this one in particular, because there's something major changing at Goldman Sachs, and we've seen it evidenced in the numbers of Goldman Sachs advisors, Goldman Sachs PWAs that have left in the last three years alone. And you were an early lever, having left the firm 10 years ago. So I want to unpack that a bit in terms of what that was about and what you think is driving it and your perspective a decade later. But let's start at the beginning, if we can. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to launch the multifamily office, Berman Capital Advisors? Sure. So my background is, I, after I graduated from undergrad, I went to work at Arthur Anderson in the tax group doing a bunch of 1040s. I then transitioned to a multifamily office that was really serving clients over the internet in the dot-com days called my CFO. And I, that was my really my first entree into the high net worth clientele on the investment side. From there, after business school, I spent uh, seven years at Goldman Sachs 
doing private wealth management, spent some time in New York, Philadelphia, and ultimately Atlanta. And then at the end of 2010, early 2011, I launched Berman Capital Advisors. And what is Berman Capital Advisors? Who do you serve and what's its value proposition? So Berman Capital Advisors is basically an independent multifamily office. We serve high net worth individuals ranging from $10 million and up. Our business today is 99% individuals. We do have one institutional client, but for the most part, we are serving taxable investors. We have 27 people in the office. We have two offices, Atlanta and Austin, Texas. And right now we are approaching $3 billion of assets and serving about 200 families. Yeah. Well, it's extraordinary what you've built. And it's all the more extraordinary, as I mentioned, because a decade ago, for any advisor with a billion dollars or more, let alone a Goldman Sachs advisor, to have the courage and forethought to leave Goldman behind was really anathema. So I'd like to talk about that a little. So again, part of what made it anathema was not just that independence wasn't really the mainstream thing that it is today, but it wasn't mainstream because the ecosystem to support the breakaway advisor, the advisor leaving the employee land to go independent just wasn't robust. So to leave Goldman, especially with a, I think you said you had a 60 day garden leave at the time. From where did you get the resolve? So if you can explain in your words, first of all, what garden leave is and how it impacted your decision. And and I'd love to hear kind of where the resolve to leave came from. Sure. So garden leave in, in legal terms is you are not allowed to do any type of advisory work, talk to your former clients, plan to start a new firm. You are not allowed to do that. It's literally sitting on the beach, reading a newspaper, doing nothing, and hopefully talking to your loved ones. I think for me, taking a step back, I'm very fortunate in my life in that my grandfather was a successful retailer in Birmingham, Alabama, and Goldman Sachs was the company's banker. And so he had always been a Goldman Sachs client. Uh, He had told me always, are we getting the best advice? Yes, you are there. I love you, Justin. But are you really putting your best foot forward and helping our family achieve our financial goals? And that stuck with me for a while. And finally, I said, you know, why don't I start a single family office for him? And if my former clients come with me, great. But if they don't, that's okay too, because I know at the end of the day, I'm doing what's in the best interest of my family. And so I was able to do that. And my former client said, well, if you're going to do this for your family, can you help us out as well? And I think the resolve comes from just being confident, you know, at Goldman, in any business, especially the private client business, you're an entrepreneur. They give you a computer, they give you a corporate card, they give you a phone and they say, go build your business. And you're building your business under the auspices of what I would consider to this day, probably the best brand out there. So you are truly an op- an entrepreneur working under a corporate environment. But are you really an entrepreneur if you have someone, for example, in the corner office who you can go see if you have an issue? You're not making decisions. You're not necessarily on the investment committee. Your job is to sell. And so I think the resolve came from, I really wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to fail. I wanted to succeed. I wanted to rest on my morals that I always knew I was doing what's best in the interest of the client. And do you think that you would have had that same resolve? Meaning, was the drive to be an entrepreneur stronger than the risk that you were taking? And would you have had that same resolve had you not had the certainty that at the very least, your grandfather and your family's money would have still been there to be your first clients and really seed the business? I think that's a great question. I mean, I think, look, I did have a solid foundation to start from. However, I was able to, you know, bring over 90% of my clients with me. So as I tell people to this day, it doesn't really matter whose company's name is on your business card. It matters that the person whose name is on the business card 
is what you're looking for. And I knew I could put my head on my pillow every night and knew I was doing what's in the best interest of my clients. And as a result, they followed me and I was confident in my ability that even I had to wait 60 days or 90 days or even six months. However, I knew at the end of the day that I was doing what was in their best interest. And unfortunately, you can't always say that working inside a major institution. Mm. You know, that's actually an interesting point. On the one hand, it's really about having the confidence in the depth of relationships, the trust you've built with your clients over however many years they had been with you. But it's really also about the strength of the resolve that I am not certain that I can be doing my best work here, that I am able to serve my clients wherever here is, whether that have been Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley UBS or Bob's brokerage. But the notion that there is some uncertainty that there could be, or a belief that there could be a better way to serve my clients and the resolve in that certainty or that belief really has to be stronger than any fear of garden leave or reprise from Goldman or anything of the sort. Yes, absolutely. And I think while you're inside a big bank, like you said, whether it's Goldman Sachs or in any firm, the Kool-Aid is so strong and you are drinking from the Kool-Aid and it's strong and it's spiked. But when you get out and you see that the investment landscape and the talent that's out there that you can tap into by being independent, is so refreshing. And I think that was the biggest eye-opening experience is that we're getting access to the same funds I had access to at Goldman, no ifs, ands, or buts. And I think it's either one way, their way, or the highway at some of these banks, and that's just not, not the case. Relationships matter. But how does that work? So I want, we're going to come back to much more about what was going on at the time, but I don't want to lose that thought you just brought up. You just said, I'm able to get access to all the same funds that I had access to at Goldman. I didn't lose anything. How does that work? How do you get access as an independent to a Goldman product, the same as if you were an employee of Goldman? I think that, um, you know, throughout my time, I've done a good job of, of having mentors in the business. And some of my mentors were from my time that I was at Georgetown. I was very close to the CIO. Some of my time when I was at Wharton. And I had access to some members of the board and I just took the initiative. I treated them like clients and said, Hey, Mr. or Mrs. Smith, I'm launching a new firm. I really want access to this strategy. I know either you're an investor or you have relationships at this firm. Can you make an introduction? And by the way, this was coming out of a time where we had just gone through the global financial crisis and funds needed capital. I mean, they were, they were getting redemptions. They were getting withdrawals. And as long as the strategy remained the same, they welcomed, you know, open doors. Sure. You know, as long as it passes muster, meaning as long as it passed our firm's due diligence, we would love to allocate to great uh, managers. So that's one thing. The other thing is there is a tremendous amount of talent that just doesn't want to be on a blank bank's platform. And so the notion of open architecture, I think is a false sense of security. When a firm tells a client, you know, we don't care if you invest in our bank's product or you go invest in an exchange traded fund, we're indifferent, or we have access to the entire universe. That could be true, but that in reality, that's just not what happens. For example, if we find a $50 million multifamily opportunity, no bank in their right mind is going to take the time to diligence a $50 million opportunity when they're managing trillions of dollars. It's not their business model. There's nothing wrong or right about that. It's just not what they do. And so we've had a lot of success investing in smaller, more boutique funds where maybe they have a niche strategy. Maybe they have a very similar strategy of a product that's offered on a bank's platform but because just by nature, they are a smaller fund or a first time fund, the bank's just not going to take the time to diligence that because they can't put billions of capital into the strategy. The manager doesn't want that. And so that's where there's an opportunity. And I think that once I left, the world just opened up and to say, wow, I mean, we have Harvard and Yale as investors and Berman Capital can invest alongside Harvard and Yale. That's pretty interesting. 
Yes, it is. So tell, let's back up a bit. What was going on at Goldman at the time? And I guess what I'm looking at or what I'm asking is, was it more of a push or more of a pull to leave? Was it because you were so frustrated with what was going on that you felt pushed to go? Or was it more about the resolve and passion to go be a business owner? I mean, it's a combination of both. I mean, number one, there was always compliance issues that, that I ran into. For example, uh, if a client said to me, I always want to keep a million dollars of cash, you know, and I'm under, operating under a bank, I said, okay, here's some money markets that we have access to. But really, the money markets might only be paying you 10 basis points. Why don't you go take this million dollars and open up four FDIC insured accounts at a local bank paying a teaser rate of one and a half percent? And so I think... And the firm just did not like that. When I knew in my heart, it was the right thing to do for the client. And so why would I not do that right thing? Even if it meant taking revenue from me and my team, I knew long-term that I was going to win. And that's what I've learned a lot in this business. You have to be long-term greedy. If you're short-term greedy, you're going to lose. And so that's why I was successful. And so at the time, we had just gone through a mortgage crisis where we learned more about our firm internally by reading the covers of the Wall Street Journal, regardless if the articles were right or wrong. Our clients would be reading the same articles and they would say, wait a second, the markets are down 40% in 2008, yet your proprietary trading desk made money every single day of the quarter, or you supported this candidate or that candidate. And I said to them, that's not me. You know, that's the firm. But there's no division that it affects greater than the private client side. And that it starts to wear on you. As an entrepreneur and as a risk taker, you get beaten up. And that's and you should expect to get beaten up. And you gotta come back and you gotta and you gotta step up and you just gotta conquer it the next day. It's like going to war, similar to what we're going through right now with this unfortunate pandemic. However, the more resilience you have and the more courage and leadership. And the leadership is just not shown necessarily inside of a big bank. So today you've been out of Goldman for 10 years, but what we hear more than anything from Goldman advisors who are thinking about leaving their pushes or their frustrations usually fall into three buckets. One is lack of investment flexibility so, you know, your comment about access to a much more robust, a true open architecture of investment and investment landscape and talent really rings true. The second thing is obviously a payout or take-home economy that's lower than the street. And three is the sense that the private wealth group is moving downstream, that a brand that had always been synonymous with the ultra high net worth is sort of being somewhat diluted. And those three things seem to be the biggest driver. Does that sound right to you? Were those things frustrating you or, or on your radar at the time 10 years ago as well? I've never been concerned about money, but in terms of the investment uh, platform, I would say absolutely. That's true. And not knowing, not being involved in the decision process. So being independent and chairing our investment committee at the firm, I at least have an in, input into managers that we hire and that we fire and investments that we go into and that we don't. And we're going to make mistakes, but at least I can put my finger on, well, I made this decision and I'm going to live by it. It's been a great decision or it's been a poor decision. So having that insight into why certain managers are hired and fired and are there other ulterior motives for example, are we getting paid to raise money for this fund? Oh, that's why you want us to recommend that fund. I get it. And then, you know, in terms of the brand, the dilution of the brand, I absolutely see that. When I can go to this day, I can go open a, a Marcus.com uh, bank account, which is Goldman Sachs, mm -hmm. you know, and get paid a higher savings rate than I would if I'm just a regular private client of the firm. That really doesn't make sense to me. So I do think there's a big push in the retail chain because it's much more profitable. I mean, I think you look at Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan, they've done a great job of going into the retail chain and, and that's profitable. But for me, I want that touch and I want that stickiness. And I think that that's much easier yet harder to do when you're working with families that have $25 million or more. 
you're involved in divorces, which are unfortunate. You're involved in when kids get arrested and you're trying to help, you know, help them, steer them. You're involved in things that, that create that stickiness of a relationship as opposed to let us um, lend money to you and, and use us to have a mortgage on, you know, sell a mortgage or, or open a checking account. That's a transaction. That's not a relationship. Mm-hmm. So I'd love to focus for a little bit about your departure from Goldman, because while 14 teams have left in the last three years alone, and you know I've been privileged and had the honor of representing a number of them, and I know how scary it is. Garden leave, the notion of being away from your clients for 60 to 90 days is scary. The notion of leaving the mothership, a pretty powerful imprimatur the notion of being worried about legal hassle and the notion of, you know, how will my clients fare and follow? So let's look at that for a minute, if you don't mind. How did your clients respond to the launch of Berman Capital? Again, as I mentioned, I I do think that it's really important that clients are able to look at the name of your business card, irrespective of the firm, and trust that. Trust your person on the business card. So let's assume that the trust is there. Then you have to ask yourself, okay, now I'm at a startup. I don't know much about the startup. This was right around Bernie Madoff. And so the first questions we were getting were, how do I know you're not the next Bernie Madoff? But by being independent, by having a separate custodian, by having a separate performance provider, by having a separate team that oversees your money, those are three different parties and three different firms. It's a much cleaner system than having one firm do everything manage, report, and custody. It's actually safer, if you think about it, on our side than maybe at a bank. And so clients, I think the first hurdle was, how do I know you're not the next Bernie Madoff? The second hurdle was, okay, let's talk about the investment team and the breadth and depth of your investment team. At the time, though, the evolution of ETS were very popular. And so we're coming on board strong. And so people, I would say to them, why do you need a big bank to buy the SPY, the S&P 500? Why do you need a big bank to buy a share of Apple? You don't. You don't even need our firm to do that. But combining that with tax planning, trust and estate advice, and investment advice to be your true financial quarterback, yes, we can do all of that. And we want to do all of that. So I think clients appreciated that there was one person that would run their financial life as opposed to different people that would kind of parachute in. And so they responded well. And again, it's just going the extra mile to make their lives simpler. I think you had said to me offline that you were managing about a billion and a half or so when you left Goldman. How much of that billion and a half actually moved with you? So what was the asset base when you first started Berman Capital? Uh, $1.3 billion. Right. So is it that $200 million worth of assets didn't follow? Was it that any clients didn't follow? What did that look like? Well, they didn't follow maybe initially, or they just wanted some time to think about the decision. At that time, obviously, the bank is calling on these clients and saying, wait a second, Justin's not here, but uh, his team is still here. And remember the investment strategy group that you spoke to, they're still here and the trust and estate group that they spoke to, that you spoke to, they're still here. So your whole team is still here, and but Justin's not. Well, you know, reality is any good advisor wants to control the relationship and brings in those uh, resources because they're strong. However, you know, kind of the buck stops with Justin. So while those teams are still there, Justin really knew our entire picture and our goals. And I think that that's really important to make sure that you're always driving the relationship and that while their team's there and available to help and assist you, you're you're the contact. They have to come through you. Well, you know, you bring up a good point because we work a lot with private bankers and private bankers are all about a team approach where there's a relationship manager, there's a banker, there's an investor, and then there are all sorts of support people that scaffold the client. And it's great for the bank because it makes a private banker's book less portable for just that reason, because there isn't always one person, as you say, that controls the relationship. 
But for a Goldman Sachs advisor, you're 100% right that the smart ones, the ones that want to ensure that they've got optionality, that, that not necessarily that they're building a book to leave, but if they want to be able to leave, uh, should they choose to do so at some point, they build a business where they make sure that they are controlling the relationship, even when they bring in others to support them. But that is a worry, is that, okay, so I leave. And the bank does a good job, especially when I'm on the beach for 60 or 90 days, of making sure that they let the clients know that they're going to st- be better served if they stay here than if they leave and follow me. So what would your message be to a Goldman Sachs PWA who's there now thinking about that? I'd love to leave. I have all the same concerns you had, Justin, when you were leaving Goldman, but worried that the bank will disparage my name or the bank will work hard in convincing my clients to stay? Um, you know, I think that that could be the case. I and mean, I think as any type A business leaders, we're always going to, you know, want to win and be competitive. I think the reality, though, is that you, why did you leave? You're leaving because you are going to be able to service the client, you, the client better. And it's not so much in the interest of, perhaps the way that you've been servicing the client in the past because of certain restrictions. But now I think that the model of being completely open is, is the best approach for you and your family. And so there's, there's obviously two ways that advisors um, do well in our business. Either they leave and they go to another wirehouse and get paid out a big sum of money or they build a business and by attracting more and more clients. And I think that that's exactly what you're doing. And I think the more creative teams is, Hey, maybe you offer them equity into your new business. There's, you have to be creative when you leave a Goldman Sachs because the resources are strong. The firm is great. There's nothing negative you can say about Goldman Sachs. However, is it about Goldman Sachs or is it about you? And I think that, being creative in, on how you leave and how you set up your firm can trump any of the negativity. And if people are speaking negative, then I think that any smart, high net worth individual who has spent his or her years building a business and having a liquidity event will figure that out. You have to be confident because there's probably never a better time right now than, than starting your own business because the resources outside of the bank that are geared towards the RIA or multifamily office world are stronger than they've ever been. And did you serve your garden leave at the time? I believe you said you did. And the the $64 million question is, did Goldman come after you? No, no. Yeah, the answer is yes, I served and, and Goldman didn't come after me. I mean, the reality is I'm a little advisor in Atlanta, Georgia. I mean, did, are they really going to spend time coming after Justin Berman? I think they have. You know, these banks have much bigger issues to fry than coming after an advisor. And by the way, if they were smart, they would realize, hey, this is a new channel for us, this RIA family office. So why would I come after Justin when he's going to open his firm with a good amount of money? Maybe I can start selling him Goldman products to offer to his clients. So when one door might have shut, the other doors are open. And that's what we've seen today is that Goldman's done a great job serving this RIA community. And they they have resources that they make available, just like Morgan Stanley, just like UBS, just like JP Morgan. They're smart. So while I might not be sitting in a Goldman Sachs seat, I can still be a champion of the firm by offering some Goldman Sachs products to our clients if I think that they make sense. So, okay, you're right that as PWAs go, private wealth advisors at Goldman go, they could have, Goldman might have made the calculus that a billion dollar single advisor in Atlanta isn't worth our time fighting. But today we're watching teams with $5 billion or $7 billion leave. And to my knowledge, none of the 14 teams that have left have, Goldman has come after either. So I don't know that the calculus is quite the same. It's not worth our time because honestly, if they are looking to protect their private wealth franchise, the more they lose a $5 billion team or even a billion dollar team, every time they lose one, it sends a message to the rest of the team 
wow, there's light on the other side. You know, the grass could be greener. We're at risk of losing others. It's more of a PR loss, a public relations loss than it is anything else. So what was it about how you managed the transition from a legal perspective in serving the garden leave that you think prevented you from raising the hackles of uh, or getting into Goldman's crosshairs? Well, I think the fortunate thing is my father is a very prominent tax accountant in Atlanta, and we shared to this day, he shares clients with Goldman. But back then, he and I shared a lot of clients together. And he knew just by being able to advise his clients from a tax perspective, he knew what was going on in their accounts. And so I think that's how you, you know, that's how you can potentially stay close to clients is work with their other service providers while you're figuring out what you're going to do. But I think the nature of the day, you know, the theme is being confident and that I think that you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. The 60, 90 days is very uncomfortable, but I think it's also a time where that a lot of true leaders will emerge. And I remember a Goldman Sachs partner telling me, Justin, you're making a lot of money at Goldman. You've got a lot of ordinary income. Wouldn't it be great to change that ordinary income to capital gain income? So I'm thinking to myself, well, how am I going to do that if I'm still at the firm? I want to build my own firm. I want to make a name for myself and for the team that I have at Berman Capital. I wake up every day knowing I have 27 people that depend on me showing up to work. And that's a good feeling because I can affect their families. I can affect their lives. I can affect their future. And inside a big organization, you just, you just it's just not the same. Yeah. So... The other thing that Goldman private wealth advisors worry about if they're contemplating leaving is not just the legal wrath of Goldman, but do they have the confidence to go up against Goldman in general, to continue to win business going forward, to port all of their clients with them? And I know you you mentioned that you've seen a whole world of access to an investment landscape and talent that you had no idea existed before you left. But you mentioned to me offline that there was a time where you felt not necessarily scared, but uncertain. Oh, my God, did I make the right move by leaving Goldman or by not taking a big check and going elsewhere? Can you share with us a little bit about what happened? In terms of not taking a big check, I knew in the back of my head that if I took a big check, I would be set for life and I really wouldn't have to worry. And my motivation of showing up at work every day? Would it be there? I knew in the back of my mind, it would be the same stuff, whether I went from Goldman to JP Morgan to UBS to Morgan Stanley to any, it's all the same. And by the way, you can line up independent firms and banks and we're all the same. There's no silver bullet in this investment industry. And if people tell you there is, then they're just, it's just not accurate. And so If there's no silver bullet, how are you going to get a client when you're going up against a big bank? You're going to outservice them is what you're going to do. And you're going to provide services that a bank probably can't provide. Maybe that's on the tax side. Maybe that's on the legal side. But the day and age of going up against a bank is very, is very easy. Not to say that you're going to win them all, but the only reason why somebody goes to a bank, especially Goldman is for the brand. It's not because of investment performance and it's not because of, you know, they have a, uh, they can offer a line of credit cheaper than Berman Capital. That's not true. Our lines of credit are much more competitive than banks because we're not a broker dealer. There's no spread on top of what a Fidelity or what a bank in New York Mellon offers us. So it's actually probably costs, definitely more cost effective And then couple that with maybe you charge the client a flat dollar fee. Well, that's interesting because when I was at Goldman, we were all on basis points. And so the business model is such where, yes, the market goes up, you pay me more. If the market goes down, you pay me less. But if you've lost money, you still have to pay me. Well, maybe there's a way around that. And so I would say that's how you can also win businesses. Think creatively of how you charge clients. Maybe you charge them a very nominal flat fee with a performance fee. So 
I think you have to be creative because the hardest competitors for us are other independent firms, not the banks. Right. And what about the economics? So, and what I mean by that is, especially 10 years ago, young guy, you know, a long runway ahead of you, never a thought or never looked back about the fact that there are some very aggressive recruiting bonuses being paid probably even bigger today than it was 10 years ago. But even 10 years ago, the transition incentives were pretty large. What about the thought of leaving chips on the table, the notion of not monetizing the business mid-career at that point? It's really simple. I would have made $20 million to $25 million at some banks, and I still have their offer letters today. And I would be set for life. However, am I making that money because I'm a great advisor and they want me, or am I making that money on the backs of clients? And so I am selling my clients' businesses for my personal gain. And that, for me, is not ethical. I want to just ask you how you got from there, meaning Goldman Sachs employee, to here, meaning independent business owner. And I know that you relied on um, a firm to help you to build and really support Berman Capital, at least in the early days. Can you talk with us a little bit about that? Sure. So I knew in starting the firm, I knew I was good at a couple of things and I knew I needed help on some other things. One of the areas I needed help on was in the investment world. It's that every day, my job, and to this day, my job is working with clients and finding new clients in the relationship side. I'm not one that wakes up every morning reading the Wall Street Journal. That's just not who I am. And so I needed a firm who all they thought about was the Wall Street Journal, the investment implications, asset allocation decisions. So I used a firm out of New Jersey called Massey Quick, and they allowed me to basically be on their investment committee. I paid them for a service, which was using their investment due diligence as a platform, so to speak. And then clients would sign two agreements, one with Berman Capital and one with Massey Quick, which we all rolled up into one agreement, but basically it was two agreements. And so I used them as really my outsourced CIO, chief investment officer. And I chose them amongst three firms. And I got the names of these three firms from some hedge fund managers that I've known personally since I was born. And they say, we see all firms out there. We see all the banks, all the independent firms. You need to talk to three independent firms. And then you come back to us and tell us what your decision is and why. And so that's what I did. And how about your custodian and your technology partners today and where you get your research and thought leadership from? Sure. So our custodian, we're custodian agnostic. I would say most of our assets are at Fidelity or Pershing today. Our technology partners consist of Black Diamond on the reporting side. We also use eMoney. We use a couple of rebalancers from um, Blaze in particular on the portfolio implementation side. And Salesforce, I would say, are the four major technology partners. On research and thought leadership, we have a research team of five people who do nothing but work on our asset allocation, work on investment due diligence, work on portfolio construction. And our thought leadership comes from a lot of places. Number one, it comes from internal. And so our team is tasked with developing their own thinking. Number two would be obviously all the managers that come and see us. Three would be our clients. Sometimes our clients have great and are shown great investment ideas because of who they are and they'll send them to us and we'll be able to diligence them. And I think obviously four will come from the banks. I mean, the banks send us tons of stuff, tons of information. I mean, it's information overload. Probably 10 times a day, we'll get emails from all of these providers to say, we have this strategy or here's our thinking on the market. Um, and, and so there is definitely no shortage of thought leadership out there. It's really looking at all of it and making sense and having your own opinion. Yeah. And curating it, I suppose, culling it down. Exactly. Correct. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about the present moment. So we record this at the end of, I've sort of lost track of time here, but I think it's the end of week eight or so of our 
kind of national lockdown. The country is just beginning to open up again, and it's been a crazy time. How has the COVID crisis impacted your business? And whether that be in terms of client performance or how you are living your life and how you're conducting your business, what does it look like today? Okay. On the client performance side, I think in times of extreme volatility, you start to really understand the true risk of a portfolio. So when high yield bonds, investment grade bonds, municipal bonds are down five to 20%, and then you have securitized assets that are down over 50%, you really start to understand the risk of a portfolio. So I'd say performance wise, clearly we've taken a hit just by being invested in the markets and such. So, but that's nothing that we can't explain. In terms of how we're dealing with the crisis with our clients on the, I would say, relationship side, we've had a lot of calls, not just calls about the markets, because there's tons of that. It's more about not just financial security, but mental health. So we had a conference call recently with a therapist for our clients. We had a conference call with the head of infectious diseases at University of Alabama, Birmingham. We've had calls with obviously managers on the investment side, but really now we're spending more quality time with clients, but not just about their financial security. You know, are they getting out? Are they taking walks? And I think that that's important in terms of how we're dealing with our team. I've scheduled a 15 minute check in with every employee of the team just to see how they're doing and offering my assistance personally. I think that we're spending a lot of time just talking about what it means to be successful and how can we help the community. So recently we just made a large grant uh, to a program in Atlanta whose job is to give computers to low-income individuals in K through 12 that don't have access to a computer. So in times when there's no wireless and they don't have computers because of their economic situation, we stepped in and provided computers to many individuals. So I I think it's obviously um, um, scary at the same time, you know, the notion is the storm has come, but how you're going to react from the storm is much more important. And some storms come to clear your path. So I think that that's the, the mantra we're taking. Yeah. I, I see it the same way. I, I have to believe that not only advisors, but we as the human race will learn from this and be better as a result of it. So I'm with you. One of the things we hear from independent advisors, no matter what their background was, is the that the freedom to communicate, the freedom and creativity to communicate without the limitations of a big firm has been a real eye-opener, really wonderful for them during this crisis. So what are the ways other than good old fashioned phone call, Zoom and FaceTime and the like, have you used to communicate with clients during this time? Uh, We've done a lot of interviews, live interviews, Um, you know, clearly the traditional stuff everybody does. So we've done a lot of live interviews, a lot of live podcasts, so to speak. So, um, you know, that's the way that we've communicated. Mostly they want to see our faces. They don't want to just read a document. And so we are definitely out there live. Uh, And and Zoom is, we've used Zoom and Microsoft Teams a lot and it's it's been great. Mm. Uh, I think that, you know, the notion of being in an office uh, is wonderful because there's a lot of camaraderie, but I think we're operating, you know, probably even better with Zoom at home. Yeah. it's, It's so funny that technology we've always had but I don't know that people used it. And I think that, um, you know, the, the financial services industry in particular has really leapfrogged and fi- the wealth management industry, I should say, has really leapfrogged and figuring out that you don't necessarily have to travel to see a client in order to feel connected with them. And I expect that Zoom meetings or Microsoft Teams meetings is going to be a lot of the new way things get done after this. Yes, but I'm anxious to get back on the plane, to be honest. I, <laughs> I really want to see our clients and, and you know sit next to them. So yeah, well, hopefully, hopefully sooner rather than later. Yes. Um, let's just look at the future for a minute. You had told me offline that after ten years of building Berman Capital, you're ready to begin to think about adding inorganic growth to the mix. That having gone from 
a billion three to three billion in 10 years is fabulous. You're looking to really accelerate that. So what is the goal in terms of real acceleration of growth? How do you expect to do that in the next chapter of Berman Capital? Yeah, I think we're just now starting to think about that. And I appreciate you bringing that up. You know, for us, starting an office and opening an office in Austin is a big first step in that evolution. And that was earlier this year. And I think we're going to continue with that kind of hub and spoke model where Atlanta will be the hub, but we'll have offices in other major cities where our clients are. So maybe that's Nashville, maybe that's Boca, maybe that's, um, you know, Boston, Thing, cities where um, we have a lot of concentration already. And, and so I think that's where we're going to focus our time and energy is building a presence in those cities. Um, Austin, we have 25 families we work with a lot um, every day. Uh, we go there a lot. And so it made sense for us to open an office. Same thing with South Florida, et cetera. So I think that's what our plans are for the next, call it one to two years. And how will you go about finding the human capital to seed those offices? Great question. And I would say we've had starts and stops on whether we buy a firm, merge a firm, merge with a firm, hire a team, and we haven't found a good answer. And there's answers out there, of course, but culture is so important for us. And somebody told me it would take five to seven years to build the right team. And I really believe that. It took probably seven years for us to build the right team internally. And so now that we have the right team, I think we're able to go out and bring on additional advisors because to this day, there are no new business folks in our office intentionally. We're not out there marketing ourselves. All of our business comes through referrals. And so we don't want to create that competitive environment internally about, well, I brought in this client, I should get paid more. I, I lost this client. So what do I do now? Um, that type of negative energy is just not, is not productive in a small firm. about the end game for Berman Capital? What do you think, and not that I think that that's happening anytime soon, but as you fast forward, what do you think comes next for Berman Capital? So you accelerate its growth. What happens when Justin Berman is ready to retire? Well, fortunately for me, I don't have any hobbies other than tennis and maybe Notre Dame football. So I'm only 43 years old and I have a long time to do this. And I, I have young kids. And so I always ask them, do you see yourself one day working at the firm? And, and I try to bring them into the office just to see what we do. And I've opened up stock accounts for them just to, so they can start messing around with the, the stock market in hopes that maybe one day they become interested in it. Because ideally, the path for us is, is really to groom the next generation of leadership and continue to grow that way. And that would probably require some of the management team selling their stock to, you know, the next leaders of the firm. And when will that be? I don't know. But, you know, obviously there's probably not a day that goes by where we're not getting called on by somebody that is interested in, in buying us or merging with us, et cetera. And that, you know, again, for me, the question always is, is that going to be best for the client or is that going to be best for Justin Berman? And, and, I, and I'm not, I'm just not interested in what's necessarily financially best for Justin Berman. I know at some point that will come. And if it doesn't, okay, great. I know I can, you know, leave this earth knowing I did what's best for our clients. And that's what I wake up every day saying, how can we improve our clients' lives? Yeah. Well, I think one thing that is probably true is that when you lead with doing what's best for clients it has the ancillary effect of being good for you financially as well. But it is notable that it isn't necessarily the thought. Your personal financial gain isn't what's driven the bus. But it sounds, Justin, like you've built an extraordinary business and you've got a lot more to do as a young guy with a long runway. And it sounds like you've built an extraordinary team, an extraordinary roster of clients and we're excited to see what the future holds for Berman Capital. So I thank you so very much for your time and your insights, especially at such a crazy time in everybody's lives, and look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Mindy, and thanks for all the great work that you guys do at Diamond. Obviously, you're a big influencer and a big player in the space and, and a group that a lot of people rely on. So thank you.
Justin shared a plethora of sage wisdom, but especially pertinent with his perspective on winning against a big bank. How do you do it? You outservice them and you get creative about how you charge clients. I thank you for listening. And I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants.com and click on the tools and resources link for valuable content. You'll also find a link to subscribe for regular updates to the series. And if you're not a recipient of our weekly email, Perspectives for Advisors, click on the blog link to browse recent articles. These written pieces are an ideal way to stay informed about what's going on in the wealth management space without expending the energy that full-on exploration may require. Feel free to email or call me if you have specific questions. I can be reached at 908-879-1002 or these days on my cell at 973-476-8578 or always by email, mdiamond at diamond-consultants.com. Please note that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. And again, if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to share it with a colleague who might benefit from its content. And a special thanks to advisorhub.com for sharing this podcast with your viewers and subscribers. This is Mindy Diamond on Independence.